Brenda Knight began her career at HarperCollins and went on to serve as the publisher of Cleus Press and Viva Editions. And in 2014, she was awarded Indie Fab's Publisher of the Year Award. Brenda is currently with Mango Media, and she is serving as the president of the Women's National Book Association, San Francisco chapter. Please introduce Brenda Knight. Thank you, so much. Thank you everybody for coming. And I love this um, intimate crowd. It feels like we're um, more friends of Ms. Morris um, here tonight, along with these uh, four. Um, and I, I will introduce each of the panelists later, but just so you know who they are, it's Andrea Brown, Mary Knipple, Michael Larson, and Lynn Davidson. But first, I wanted to start off by talking about um, our founder, Ms. Effie Lee Morris, who founded the Women's National Book Association, San Francisco chapter, 50 years ago. And this event kicks off a year of celebrating us being fabulous and 50, 50 and feisty. <clears throat> and I believe Ms. Effie Lee Morris was quite feisty herself. Um, she chose to be a librarian over a teacher, and in doing so, combined her personal passion for education and became one of America's leading advocates for services for children, minorities, and the visually impaired. Born in Richmond, Virginia on April 20th, 1921, Morris spent her youth in Cleveland, Ohio, where she received a Bachelor of Arts degree and a Bachelor of Library Science degree. And it's so perfect that we're here in the library. Uh, and in 1956 from Western Reserve University, um, she also got an additional degree. So she began working in 1946 as the Cleveland Public Library and established the first Negro History Week celebrating children there, which was pretty amazing when you think about the time. In 1955, she moved to New York and became the children's branch librarian in the Bronx. And three years later, in 1958, she pioneered the development of library services for blind children. She later served as president of the National Braille Club from 1961 to 1963. So pioneering, I mean, she was unstoppable. In 1963, she joined the San Francisco Public Library. <laughs> Uh, where we are tonight. And she was the first children's services coordinator. We have another wonderful one with us tonight. A year later, she created uh, the Effie Lee Morris Historical and Research a Collection for out-of-print children's books, featuring titles that depict the changing portrayals of ethnic and minority groups during the 20th century. And I had the honor of seeing that with uh, past president Kate Farrell uh, under the generosity of Lynn Davidson and uh, the um, Indonesian folklorist shelves alone were mesmerizing. I think of them often. Active in the American Library Association, Association, the ALA, since 1945, she chaired the Social Responsibilities Roundtable and was an early supporter and chairman of the Coretta Scott King Award. Um, and from 1971 to 1973, she was the first African-American president of the PLA, Public Library Association. In 2008, she was elected to honorary membership in the American Library Association, the organization's highest honor. And she was given the honorary membership in recognition for her vision, advocacy, and legacy to children's services in public libraries. And that was presented um, in her honor by Speaker of the House at the time, Nancy Pelosi, who was a big fan. Um, and so that's just actually a few of the things that you can say about the amazing Miss Evie Lee Morris. Um, and I want to actually hear from those who knew her. And so we're going to start with Andrea Brown, um, who is going to have, I think, quite a lot to say. Andrea Brown is president of the Andrea Brown Literary Asso Agency, which is based in Northern California, with offices in L.A., San Diego, Chicago, and New York. She's a former editor from New York City, former president of the San Francisco WNBA chapter, director of the Big Sur Children's Writing Workshops, and board member of the San Francisco Writers Conference and author of Writers and Artists Hideouts. And we would love, Andrea, for you to share your memories of Ms. Morris. Thank you, Brenda. 
Well, first I want to say I'm just so delighted to be here to celebrate the 50th anniversary of this really wonderful, important association. I was also a board member of WNBA New York chapter because I moved here in 1990. And so throughout the whole decade of the 80s, I was a WNBA New York chapter member, a board member. And I was so excited when we started to expand to other cities like San Francisco, Los Angeles, Nashville. Um, I think, I, yeah, I was there when we started, was it the Dallas or one, which Texas chapter? Is it Houston or Dallas? Dallas, Dallas. And I remember thinking, wow, they even read books in Dallas. Wow, that's great. Let's, let's get a chapter going there. So, yeah, I was one of those provincial New Yorkers, really. You know, I didn't think there was life west of the Hudson um, until I moved west of the Hudson and found out not only is there a life, but a much better life. And how many creative, intelligent, bright, wonderful ideas you could find on West Coast writers and the writers' conferences and the arts communities out here. So I just became um, totally enamored with the West Coast, and I could work for the Chamber of Commerce within two weeks of working here. I don't even like going back to New York anymore. So um, I just want to say a little bit also then certainly about Effie Lee Morris. I was proud that while I was president of this chapter, we did start this lecture series that we're celebrating tonight, the Effie Lee Morris Lecture Series. And as many of you know, we've had wonderful programs and top illustrators and authors come to speak and children coming to, to hear people and so many different things that I know she would have loved. Um, Effie Lee loved nothing more than putting good books into the hands of children everywhere. And she, I remember, we, because I, she, you know, I was one of the people in the chapter that was also in children's books. So I remember so many times just her talking about a new book she discovered, and she'd ask me if I read it. And I would, like, mostly say no, uh, because I'm so busy reading all of our clients' works that I didn't get a chance to read all the other books. I mean, thousands of books, 50,000 books published a year. I wished I could have read more of them, especially the ones Effie Lee told me about. And she would discover wonderful new illustrators, and we would talk about the new art and art styles. And, and so we had a lot in common. And um, I think that she was always so, the, the thing I think I love most, she was so elegant. And she would always wear matching hats and suits and beautiful scarves. And I so admired her style and her fashion flair um, and her grace. And just her smile would light up the room. I never heard Effie Lee raise her voice or get excited about anything. Even when we'd have board meetings and we'd have disagreements about something in board meetings, she was always the quiet one. I would get rowdy. I would yell at someone. Go, I wouldn't yell. I would go, wait, what about blah, blah, blah? And she would just sit quietly and calm me down sometimes at the board meetings. Um, so the Effie Lee Morris programs that we have here, it just seemed like the perfect way to honor you know, such an amazing and accomplished woman. Uh, her book collection here is unique and diverse. I hope that some of you will be here to celebrate the 60th anniversary, the 75th anniversary. I hope we have many, many more generations of anniversaries here to celebrate. And um, let me see if there's anything else I did want to say. Just basically that um, her legacy, I think, is something that has transcended just the children's book world. Because I'll mention, I remember mentioning her name to people all over. And people knew of her and respected her and looked up to her. And I just hope that future librarians know about her and follow in her footsteps. So thank you all for coming. If you're not a member of WNBA yet, please do join. It is a really valuable and important women's association before the Me Too movement before women had a voice. And I know in New York, we were very excited to know about the fact that, you know, in a time when women weren't even allowed to join some of the men's publishing organizations, we existed for women out there. And so I'm just uh, so happy that we're celebrating 50th. I agree. Thank you, Andrea. It, it is always amazing to me that the Women's National Book Association is 101 years old before women even had the right to vote. Um, this advocacy group was helping women get jobs as booksellers, in, in publishing, as editors, as writers, as authors, as speakers. And so I feel like maybe that's what attracted Effie Lee Morris, like from one pioneering champion um, to another. 
And next we have another past president of WNBA San Francisco chapter, which is Mary Knippel, author, speaker, publisher, and your writing mentor. And she is fiercely committed to guiding you to take pen in hand to help you tell and unleash your story that is worth so much worth writing. Mary began journaling at the age of 11 and views writing as a powerful companion, advisor, and healing tool. Marriage, raising a family, moving across the country twice, and breast cancer twice have given Mary plenty of journal material and the basis for her book, The Secret Artist, part memoir and part self-help as it chronicles the pivotal role creativity played in her recovery from breast cancer. Mary's clients come to her when they're paralyzed about where to begin, what to say, and how to make sense of the life-changing message they know they are here to deliver. She is someone who believes passionately in her clients and helps them polish their words until their message sparkles and shines. So, Mary Knipple. Thank you, Brenda. I am. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here tonight to be able to champion Effie Lee's lecture series as well as her legacy. Um, I was fortunate enough to be on the board with Andrea when they, um, the group came up with the idea of the lecture series. And so I had just moved to California. It was the second of our, our moves. And I literally got picked up and brought to the WNBA meetings because Andrea and the membership chair lived on the coast side. <laughs> and I didn't know my way around San Francisco, but they brought me to the meetings and I got enmeshed in the writing world as soon as they found out, oh, you're a writer? Come with us. And that nurturing I also found being a part of um, WMBA. And ever the first time I met Effie Lee, it was um, just to be enveloped and welcomed as a fellow writer and lover of words. And being able to bring my daughter to the lecture series was such a treat. And I felt so privileged to be able to expose her to the richness that the, the lecture series offered us. And as president of WMBA, I would receive many phone calls from Effie Lee saying, you are doing such a fabulous job. And I would just swell with pride that she was on my side and always there to support. And they, she may not have, have had children of her own, but I felt like we were all her children, that she nurtured everyone that she came in contact with and saw the potential of what we could be and what we could do. Um, Andrea talked about her style and her quiet grace. I remember when she came to one of the board meetings and she said, I've got something to tell you. She had won a contest in Paris for the hat that she was wearing. <laughs> and she was so proud of that. <laughs> and that was just typical because she always was dressed so nicely. And when we celebrated our anniversary and had a grand um, banquet and we bought a tiaras for the ladies, uh, board members to wear, and she was so excited about that, that, that tiara that she went home with it. <laughs> um, and it was, you know, something that we had bought at the, the party store, but it was just festive and she liked that. And I think that quiet grace was just part of her whole vernacular, and she just brought it wherever she was. And I, I so admired that, and I was happy that I could be in that um, structure with her, and that she brought it to WNBA, and any time that she was, I was around her. Um, I have to say that She's the reason why I got to be a speaker at a Baptist ceremony because when I went to her send-off party, um, they asked anybody who was there if they wanted to say a few words about Effie Lee, and I was 
the first one in line, I jumped right up and I said, I just have to say, I love this lady. Um, growing up in a small town in Minnesota, I wasn't exposed to people of color. And being around her and how she just welcomed everyone and treated you all with such respect and dignity, it was such a shining example for me. And so I wanted to say that I celebrated her and I cherished the relationship that I had with her. And being um, a speaker and being able to get in touch with my emotions has been a journey and I'm so happy that I can embrace that with you today because she was somebody that really touched people and I'm so glad that we are here honoring her tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, I love that we're learning so much about Ms. Morris. Um, I mean, I knew she was a champion of, of underserved children and um, disabled and visually impaired kids. Um, and, I, and then she was also a personal champion, it sounds like, to everyone she knew. She touched each person she knew, and I, I mean, I never got to meet her, but I feel like I have somehow been touched by the grace of um, Ms. Effie Lee Morris. And next we have uh, Michael Larson, and I said we were 50 and fabulous, and so um, I printed this out in such a small font that I'm going to have to do this, <laughs> maybe a little more than 50 and fabulous. Uh, Michael Larson co-founded Larson Pomada Literary Agencies in 1972. Over four decades, the agency sold hundreds of books to more than 100 publishers and imprints. The agency has stopped accepting new authors, but Michael loves helping all writers, and I can tell you he does. He gives talks about writing and publishing. He does author coaching. He wrote How to Write a Book Proposal and How to Get a Literary Agent and co-authored Guerrilla Marketing for Writers. Mike is co-director of San Francisco Writers Conference and the San Francisco Writing for Change Conference. So without further ado, Michael Larson. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Oh, is this, you good? Yes, they're recording it. Good. Um, the first chapter that uh, I remember coming to uh, was to see the Doubleday editor, Luther Nichols. It wasn't long after Elizabeth and I started the agency. Peggy Saracen had succeeded Effie Lee as president, and the, the dinner meetings were held at Cafe du Nord on Upper Market. Luther was a wonderful guy who loved sharing his wisdom with writers. Here are three examples. A short pencil is better than a long memory. <laughs> no good book is ever too long, and no bad book is ever too short. And then there's the story about the woman who sent her novel to an editor and didn't hear back for a long time. So finally she called the editor and asked about the novel, and the editor couldn't recall it. So he asked, well, was there a mystery? And she said no. And he asked, well, was it a romance? And she said, no. Well, was it historical? And she said, well, it wasn't when I sent it. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth met Effie, Effie Lee before I did. Actually, Uncle Sam brought them together. In a fleeting moment of enlightenment, the government was giving libraries money to buy books. And Elizabeth worked in library promotion, which focused on children's books. So meeting Effie Lee, who was head of the children's books at the Brooklyn Library, and one of the most prominent people in the New York library system was part of Elizabeth's job. Writing this makes me appreciate that Uncle Sam was also the matchmaker for Elizabeth and me. We met in 1968 over the oysters at a Baker and Taylor New Books preview for librarians at the Pennsylvania Hotel on 7th Avenue across the street from Pennsylvania Station. Elizabeth was library promotion director at Dial, a small but hot house, when E.L. Doctorow was the editor-in-chief, and uh, Norman Mailer, and, and James Baldwin used to stop by. At the time, I was assistant advertising manager at William Morrow. Effie Lee always took a passionate interest in the chapter and was on the board for as long as she was able. I remember one, <coughs> excuse me, one board meeting for which we met in Effie's, Effie Lee's cozy apartment on Cleary Court. She always had firm opinions and a remarkable presence for communicating them. She never raised her voice, as Andrea said, but she had a quiet authority that grew out of her knowledge experience, and love for the chapter, and it commanded respect. She also had a sense of humor and a delightful smile. 
Her comments and suggestions were always taken seriously. She yearned for greater diversity in books, and she would be thrilled at the fact that diversity in writing and publishing are finally flourishing. Adele Horowitz, uh, a charter member of the chapter, um, and uh, a former executive editor, William Morrow, and a friend of ours for decades, was president for two year, two two-year terms. Then uh, Elizabeth was president for two terms. Uh, she couldn't come, so Brenda asked me to stand in for her because as Elizabeth's vice president, I did the programs while Elizabeth was president. As Andrea mentioned, the WNBA is a wonderful organization, and it's needed more than ever. It was probably the, maybe the first women's literary organization. And after half a century, the San Francisco chapter is a venerable part of the Bay Area's literary ecosystem, its community of the book. The WNBA is one of the many reasons why the Bay Area is America's second largest center for writing and publishing and the best place in the world to be a writer. This chapter is part of Effie Lee's legacy. And blessed with the kind of leadership you've heard represented on the panel, the organization will continue to find new ways to serve Bay Area writers and sustain the spirit of community that unites us all. It's an old New Yorker cartoon that Effie Lee would love. It shows a man standing at a bookstore counter, and behind the counter there's a woman looking up from a thick reference book, and she's saying, well, I'm sorry, sir, but the future of publishing is out of print. <laughs> Well, thanks in part to Effie Lee and the WNBA, books will continue to be an essential part of the Bay Area's culture. Many thanks. Thank you, Michael. And I'm going to take a moment for shameless self-promotion, which is Pitcherama, which actually has agents from the Andrea Brown Agency. Mary Knipple is doing coaching, and Michael Larson is taking pitches and being the font of knowledge that he is. It's on March 31st at the Women's Building. We have more information uh, back there at the Champagne Table. So help yourself to a sparkling beverage, and we'd love to see you at Pitcherama. And I may be a font of knowledge, but I'm only 10 point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the San Francisco Writers Conference, Michael, I saw a tiara. I saw tiaras, actually. So I thought that was a good sign. <laughs> um, and next we have somebody who um, works here and contributes on a daily basis, and that is Lynn Davidson, who served as program manager of the San Francisco Public Library's main children's center since 2011. She was previously the manager of the Children's Department of Orange County Library System in Orlando, Florida. Second happiest place on earth, maybe? Mm -hmm. Um, Lynn is also an award-winning journalist who spent eight years as managing editor of a weekly newspaper in Orlando. She continues to work as a free freelance writer and editor and is also a poet who is working on a collection of poems that take place right here in San Francisco's Tenderloin neighborhood. So welcome, Lynn Davidson. Thank you. Thank you so much to Brenda and the membership of the WNBA for inviting me. It is such an honor to be here with you. I will preface everything that I say by letting you know that I just got over a really bad flu, and so I've got my handy cough drops, my handy water, so I'm hoping that my voice will last. I've been saving it up for you. Um, so I am the only person here on this panel, I think, who got to know Effie Lee Morris after her death. Um, because I came to work here in 2011. That was two years after she had passed away. And I was actually hired to, in part, oversee the work of the collection named in her honor, which is the Effie Lee Morris Historical and Research Collection of Children's Literature right upstairs on the second floor that Brenda was alluding to earlier. Um, I'll more about the collection in a few minutes. Um, but the way that I met Ms. Morris, or as I like to call her, Effie Lee. Um, the way that I met Effie Lee was a little bit different. I met her the day I walked into the room that houses the Effie Lee Morris collection, which is a, a very quiet um, room filled with nothing but bookshelves with about 10,000 books that she and we at the library have collected. Um, I walked into that room all by myself, and I stood there, and I felt her presence. I had heard a little bit about her, of course, before my interview when I was hired here. I had studied a lot about her. 
Um, and so I knew that she was a tireless champion of literature for children, that she was a fierce advocate for the necessity for diversity in children's literature and for inclusion for all children. Um, but I didn't have a sense of who she was. So I walked into that room and I just said, talk to me, Ephili. And what I felt was the legacy, the spirit of someone who was a very well-defined, very fierce personality and who cared about children. And I felt her asking me, what are you going to do for my kids? So I knew that my job was to make sure that I carried forward that legacy and did something for Effie Lee Morris's kids, for all of our kids. So that informs my work and that of my staff every day to this day. Um, I'll tell you three things that I know about Effie Lee. One of them, we've already discussed, her love of fashion and beautiful clothing. Every story I've ever heard about her, every picture I've ever seen of her, um, gives me an image of her in a beautiful pink St. John suit. Um, just a beautiful, elegant woman with such a great sense of personal style. And to me, I think that came from her personal pride in who she was and what she had achieved and what she did and just her love of beauty in the world. Um, the second thing I will tell you about her is that I've heard off and on through the years working at SFPL what a really, really fierce personality she was, as in she was someone who was committed. She, from what I have heard, had very high standards for children's literature and for the people who serve children. And I think that may have annoyed people at one point or another throughout her career. When I reflect on that, though, what I think is that if you were an African-American woman who was the first African-American president of the Public Library Association and the first coordinator of children's services here in San Francisco and a pioneer in so many of the other things that Effie Lee Morris did, you'd be a little bit fierce yourself. Um, I think people who have struggled, as, as she did, for recognition not only for herself professionally, but for the needs of children who were not included for much of the time that she was working. She needed to be a steely character. She needed to be able to be strong and to present a very definite idea of herself and her work. And for me, that's a very admirable quality for someone to develop. The other thing I will tell you about her is another story I heard about her, and it might refer to one incident. It might refer to a combination of a number of incidents. But I kept hearing about Effie Lee Morris, that she was very well known for taking books to kids who really needed them, kids from neighborhoods that were rough, that were filled with some degree of crime, where people, most people might have felt unsafe to go, and that Effie Lee Morris would go into neighborhoods where many other people, many other librarians, would have been uncomfortable going, and brought books and library services to kids in those neighborhoods, and that when people in those neighborhoods challenged her, maybe people who were trying to deal drugs or people who were trying to prevent good things from happening in those neighborhoods, she would stare them down. So that is one of the things that I think about when I think about Effie Lee Morris. And I think about the fact that when I stood in, in the room that houses her collection, I could feel her saying to me, what are you doing for my kids? Are you willing to do what I did? Are you willing to stand up for the kids when nobody else will? So that's part of what informs my professional work, to make sure that we, my staff and I, and SFPL are there for kids who are not necessarily still included in society in, for various reasons and in various ways. Um, and that we are there for all kids and all families to meet their needs as they exist in the real world, not as we might wish them to be, to make sure that all kids have access to books and stories and the ability to think and dream and become anything they want to be. So that's my knowledge of Effie Lee Morris. I'm going to talk to you also about her legacy, which still lives here at SFPL. And it's my pleasure to be one of the people in charge of furthering that legacy. One part of her legacy is the annual Effie Lee Morris Lecture. And I am so proud that our co-supporters and sponsors for that lecture are none other than the members of the WNBA. Um, Brenda and Kate Farrell, who is here in the audience, and their membership have been incredibly generous over the years 
with their, their support in their time and talents for this lecture. The lecture honors the legacy of Effie Lee Morris in that every year we select one author or illustrator of books for children who speaks to a diverse and inclusive experience. Some of our lecturers over the years included our very first lecturer, Lawrence Yep, who is a Bay Area author. Um, they've also included um, Christian Robinson a couple of years ago, who is another recent Bay Area author, um, a young African-American illustrator. Um, whose work still graces the library cards that you can get today here at SFPL. Um, other lecturers have included Gigi Morales, the Mexican-American illustrator who um, wrote Nino um, Wrestles the World and other picture books that draw on her own heritage. Um, other lecturers have included Tommy DePaola, who's famous for his Strega Nona books, um, Robert de Sanssouci, who is famous for his um, folklore and fairy tale books, and an incredible, very diverse collection of other authors and illustrators through the years. We are right now in the planning process for our 22nd annual Effie Lee Morris Lecture named in her honor. So I encourage you all to keep coming back to the library for information about those lectures. I'll also call to your attention the fact that we now have on the second floor mezzanine an exhibit of works by Jerry Pinckney drawn from our Effie Lee Morris collection. Um, Mr. Pinckney was our 2012 Effie Lee Morris lecturer. Um, he is an incredible illustrator who is known for his work of the African American experience. And you are really missing something if you don't come upstairs at some point between now and the end of March and see this incredible exhibit with treasures from the Effie Lee Morris collection, illustrated and written by Mr. Pinckney um, and curated by Elizabeth, who is one of my librarians in the Children's Center, who is also a tireless champion of the legacy of Ms. Morris. Um, so that's a little bit about the lecture. I'd also like to talk to you a little bit about the collection that bears Effie Lee Morris's name. And um, in that room, we have a number of books. Some of them are San Francisco history books that are both fiction and nonfiction that depict the San Francisco experience and culture as seen through children's books over time. We have old books like this one. I pulled a representative selection for you. This one's called In Old California, and it came out, I believe, in 1927. We've got some very old illustrations. I'm not sure how far you can see from where you are, but they're, they're charming old illustrations and charming old text, um, including, as many books did at the time, some very sanitized portrayals of some of the more violent and fraught periods of our state's history such as the creation and establishment of our missions and um, um, the history of our Native American peoples. Um, we also have San Francisco Boy by Lois Lenski, which is a fictional portrayal of our own San Francisco heritage. Lois Lenski was a well-known, um, I would say, Depression-era author of books for children. We also have very recent award winners and um, historically significant books, including Angel Island by Russell Friedman, who is an incredible contemporary author of books of history and biography for young people. And this tells a very moving nonfiction story of the legacy of our own Angel Island and the um, Asian American people who passed through its doors. And Mr. Friedman shows some incredibly moving pictures of the the words that the people wrote when they were in detention on Angel Island, just to see what they went through in their own words. Um, in that Effie Lee Morris collection, we also have childhood favorites for many people. Lois Lenski again, The Little Fire Engine. She created a whole series of Little This and Little That books of all different types, just fun picture books. And we also have a number of books that we call our Changing Portrayals Collection. And that's, to me, maybe the most interesting part of the collection. I often say that if you were doing a dissertation on the way children of various ethnicities were portrayed over time in works of literature written for children, you could go into the Effie Lee Morris Historical Room and do your entire thesis on the materials based in that room. Um, so we have many of our changing portrayals books are things that we wouldn't necessarily want to recommend for children any longer. Things with titles like Little Black Sambo, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, a very stereotyped, very negative view of um, children of color written in days past. But we also have 
changing portrayals. We have the classic book, The Snowy Day, written by Ezra Jack Keats, um, who happened not to be African American, but who wrote in the 60s and illustrated books um, with, at the time, groundbreaking empathy and understanding of the lives of African American kids. And then we have works written today, like Henry's Freedom Box, about Henry Box Brown, who was one of the people who escaped from slavery on the Underground Railroad, a beautiful historically themed picture book. And we have so many other books that, that really showcase the vibrancy. I, I know that Effie Lee Morris would be so happy if she were here today because my colleagues and I often say this is a golden age in children's publishing. When we look at books of every description, the diversity and the, the fact that so many children of a rainbow of ethnicities and abilities and backgrounds are, por are portrayed not only in their historical context as, as victims of slavery or or people overcoming struggles in the historical past, but as vibrant living people with families and everyday lives that are so richly portrayed. We're, we're really coming, I think, as a community, as a publishing community, as a, a children's literature community, to an awareness of the fact that this history belongs to all of us and that it is our job as librarians, teachers, writers, and publishers to really portray the full range of who our children are. And the last book I'm going to show you is called Someone Special Just Like You. It is um, written by Tricia Brown. Pictures are by Fran Ortiz. And this was done, I believe, back in the 1980s. And there's a bibliography. I sold that book. That's one, that's, oh, those, so those are our clients. Thank yeah. you so much. Tricia lives in Sacramento. That. See, this is amazing. Yeah. And the person who compiled the bibliography for this book was none other than Effie Lee Morris. Because what this, thank you so much for getting <laughs> this book into print, because it portrays in beautiful black and white photographs what life is like for children with a whole different range of disabilities. And it not only does that, but it portrays children of all different ethnicities. And so, the thing I think that moves me about this book, to which Ms. Morris contributed, and about books like this, are that we are all one people. We are all diverse. We are all part of this story that she started helping us tell and that we are continuing to tell. So every day when I think about her words to me in my mind when I first came and took my job, what are you doing for my kids? I think all of us here, including you in the audience, are doing something for Effie Lee Morris's kids because we are opening our minds and our hearts more and more every day to the experiences of all of us and to incorporating those experiences as a normal part of our lives. So thank you all for your support for the library and for Ms. Morris and for this event. Thank you so much, Lynn. I feel like we got a mini tour in the special collection. And I have a question for you. I'm gonna start off with questions for the panel. And then, of course, we'll open up to questions from all of you. Uh, but when I visited on that day, I had the sense that some of the books there, especially in the, the folklore and mythology stacks that I became obsessed with, they seemed like, in some cases, they would be like the only remaining copy of that book in print. Like, it really seemed like they were rare, rare books in many cases. Is that true? Um, I don't know if they meet the technical definition of rare, because it isn't an archival collection. So, in fact, there is the Arthur Rackham collection, which is a subset of the Effie Lee Morris collection, one of our many subsets of that collection. And that actually lives up on the sixth floor in our um, book arts and SF history collection. Um, some of the other very rare children's books live up there. We do have books that would meet the, the broad popular definition of rare, I think. We have books in that collection um, in my department going all the way back to the 1800s. Um, we have some that were published here in San Francisco. Some of the folklore books don't necessarily tie in with San Francisco or with changing portrayals, but there, as Brenda said, they're so richly illustrated or so evocative of the many cultures that make up our world that they definitely bear inclusion in that collection. So I don't know for sure that how many of them are the last copy in existence in a library, but I think many of them um, would be one of the few copies left 
of their type that might be publicly accessible. And I do know that over the years that I've been here, we've had a few researchers and um, doctoral students, library science doctoral students come and actually sit and use that collection. I had one person come all the way from Florida just to use our collection. And she and her partner were just scanning and photocopying from that collection. And she included works from that collection in her dissertation. Well, that's wonderful to hear. I'm so glad they're being archived um, a little bit all the time. Um, and so I'm gonna, we're going to ask questions of the panel. And I've learned from observing Michael Larson at the San Francisco Writers Conference, the Writers Conference for Change, to like go start on one side and then come down the other for this next question. So we'll start with Andrea uh, for this first question, which is, um, do you know what Ms. Morris's inspiration was for dedicating her life uh, to children, helping children? Well, if I did remember, I forgot now. Um, I think I remember talking about, you know, things like that with her 25 years ago. Um, I'm not sure. Do you remember, you guys, anything like what she, why she, Lynn, do you know anything about that even? I don't, I, I don't remember. I, I just know she always loved books. And so, mm -hmm. you know, when you think about the time that she went to college and, there weren't as many opportunities as there are now. Maybe being a librarian was one of the ways she thought that she could share her love of books and do something valuable within the book industry, mm -hmm. not wanting to go to New York. I think at one point she did say to me, though, that she was sort of sorry that she didn't spend some of her younger years you know, in Manhattan and maybe even book publishing. I think she would have liked to do that as well. Mm -hmm. as she, would have, she would have slayed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she would have been wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Absolutely. But um, do you remember anything else about that? Well, I got the impression that being a librarian, she affected change uh, rather than as a teacher, she would have had to be in the system. Whereas as a, a librarian, she had more influence on what the children were reading. Mm hmm. Michael? Any sense? Okay. Um, and then um, and I actually spent a good bit of time in the last uh, month scouring the interwebs for good biographies of her or bios, even just for tonight. And there wasn't that much information about her childhood and upbringing. So I wondered if we could start with Lynn and then come back this way, what you, what you know of that, if anything. I actually know about the same as you, having scoured the interwebs to, to try to piece together information about her life. I, d I may have read something about her actually working to integrate swimming pools at one point. Um, so I, d I don't actually know where that comes from. I would love to know if someone would love to write a biography of her. I would definitely want to read it. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. One of the things that I mean, occurred to me when I was thinking about this is the extent to which she was a pioneer professionally. I mean, I wonder, you know, she was head of the children's section of the Brooklyn Public Library. I mean, the New York Public Library system is the most important one in the country, and, so, and they buy a lot of books, so it's a really important market. And to, for her to achieve that position, I, I don't know how many African Americans got to that level in the library system. I, I just don't know, but I have to think she's really one of the early ones. Um, yeah, I, so, I, from what I know of the history of my profession, I think that would be a true statement. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, and then, um, and, uh, what do we know about the brief New York Times and the public library? Andrea, do you want to start with that? Before my time, not before a clue. your time. <laughs> I don't know anything about the the New York part. Okay. A mystery to be resolved by that, mm, yeah. that excellent biography that maybe somebody in this room will feel <laughs> called to write. Um, do you know if there is anybody, are there any children's books inspired by Ms. Effie Lee, Andrea, that you know of? Inspired? Uh, if not yet, no, I think I the so time so. is soon. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure there probably have been quite a few dedicated to her, I bet. Yeah, and if you go through the um, books in the F.E. Lee Morris collection, you'll see that many of them are signed by 
the authors who passed mm. through San Francisco, people that she knew. She was very good at, at forging strong friendships with authors. So there are personal dedications to her written by a number of the authors in their books in that collection. Yeah, in fact, I remember talking a lot about um, going to the ALA, which is the American Library Association Convention. Very often we'd meet there at the different ones in Chicago and other places. And so she would always run into authors, and they knew her. Um, so, yeah, that's, yeah, I've got to believe there probably are some to that question. I just don't know what titles, but All I right. think there are. Hearing this conversation makes me appreciate that there's a significant loss in, in terms of children's books that she never wrote a memoir. Yeah. I mean, she really led a unique life. I think I said that to her books. once. Oh, yeah. I think I said to her yeah. she should write her and memoir. What, what she and she laughed. <laughs> No, she had no interest in writing her memoir. It's so easy. You can dictate it to a computer. You can just dictate it. Uh, you know, I know. And, and, she left. No. I mean, you know, everything we know, a life is a legacy. So it's a, just a great pity that... Yeah. Uh, but, but you're right. It's a I told her that more it. than once, actually. Yeah. I would imagine, and this is me putting words in her mouth, but I would imagine she was so busy serving, you know, taking care of her kids that, like, she... It, it, no time for it, you know? Well, yeah. I mean, if she wasn't working, she was reading. And the gentleman with the laptop, I think you have information for us. I think that the, the, the vision of ALA for youth services, and I, I've served for a number of years on the oral history committee, and I think that there probably is a, an interview with her um, from that. But I'm just trying to get online. I Okay. When you find it, we will. Yes. Want it. Uh, I'll let you know. Oh, okay. Wonderful. I, I do have one bit of information, though, which is a photo. The last time I saw her, and that's her picture. Oh, uh, oh that is a fabulous photo. She's wearing a hat. Um, of course. She's dressed fashionably as well. Yeah. Always. And she's with um, two writers whose children, of course, have to come see her at the Credit Stack Inn Breakfast uh, Christopher Myers and Ashley Bryan. Yeah. Oh, she loved Ashley. Bryan. Yes, she was oh one of the God. speakers. Oh my God, that was her favorite. Yeah, that was her favorite. And Ashley Bryan actually designed an owl icon um, in a woodcut, her and year. she adopted that the as talisman. her personal emblem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she That's loved right. Ashley. Yes. Mm-hmm. Impressive. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's not very robust, that, or the Wikipedia that I saw it looked like it had been cut off like halfway, that somebody was editing it and sort of stopped halfway. Um, there you go with crowdsourced information, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, Kate. Stepping stone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A refuge. She wanted to share that with other students, with other children, because it meant so much to her. So, I mean, that would be a safe mm -hmm. And that would be why she would rather be a librarian than a teacher. Because a teacher doesn't have that same nurturing mm -hmm. opportunity, doesn't have the direct access to children. Or as many, as many. At, at one point, the chapter was giving yeah. away books mm -hmm. to the teddy bear room. The teddy bear room. Mm, the teddy bear room. The teddy bear room. It was in the courthouse, I yeah, think. Yeah, right, it was in the courthouse right. mm -hmm. for kids whose yeah. parents were That's so right. new and generally yeah. used books. And I don't know if Effie was involved with that, but obviously yeah. somebody should, you know, sure. should yes. certainly be you know, supportive. Yeah. How long did the teddy bear room go for? Years that we, we did were that doing for a long that time. at Christmas. We would take a collection. 
of new and gently used books, and we take over there and just leave in the room for the kids who were coming for whatever In the reason. courthouse near here, mm -hmm. right? Right. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, mm -hmm. they had to appear at the courthouse, and they would have something that they could take away. Or read. Or read at that time, or have as their own. Um, I wish we could do that exact thing again. I think we should probably figure that out. But I will say that the Women's National Book Association San Francisco chapter is um, in talks with a company or a nonprofit called Kidango um, to do the same thing. Unfortunately, the San Francisco Courthouse is not one of their areas, but all the um, suburbs like Oak, I mean Oakland, Berkeley, South Bay, San Jose. Um, I mean, it was sort of frustrating that it couldn't be San Francisco, but maybe that's left for us to do it again, figure well, the, that uh, out. The Project Homeless Connect um, does give away books at their events, like Books Hall, right nearby here. And uh, uh, they even collect children's books because uh, they're homeless children. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's certainly one, one possibility. They have like half a dozen events a year. So, I mean, what about the Children's Book be, Project? The Children's Book Project still, still collecting books. They've given away more than a million books now. You know, this is um, apropos of, of something, uh, but I met somebody at the San Francisco Writers Conference that was um, had been a homeless youth who had to escape um, Chicago where his um, mother unfortunately married a um, white supremacist, <laughs> and he had to run away from home to escape that, to, as he says, um, escape fascism, and he uh, got... he got himself off the streets and got to himself to college and got a master's degree and is now an academic shopping a memoir and a scholarly book. So, um, and he said that um, it was books that kept him going and that the libraries kept him going. And it was, he wasn't using it to like to live and sleep and brush his teeth. He was using it for the books. So, you know, I just wanted to sort of say, look what books can do for kids. <laughs> All of a sudden, they're shopping their memoir at the San Francisco Writers Conference. But again, you bring up the importance of libraries, because these kids weren't buying books, obviously. Right. So they had to find them in libraries mm -hmm. or, or through schools, whatever. So mm -hmm. You just made me think of something, too, with that conversation, because we have actually, in my department, um, occasionally when we can, we've gone out and taken brand new books that we get from publishers and... Um, library overstock books, and we've actually done neighborhood events where we've given away a lot of books. And um, I will never forget what one lady said to me when we were, I think we were on the corner of, let's see, Turk and Hyde, um, right up the street, and um, right outside the playground. And a lady came up and said, if you were standing on the street corner here and gave away children's books every day of the week, you'd have a line going all the way down blocks and blocks because it just shows you the hunger that people have for books, and not only for themselves, but for their children. Absolutely. Um, I have a question that I think, Lynn, you might know the best answer for, but do you know what children's services Ms. Morris introduced at this library? That was so far before I was here. I mm -hmm. do not know exactly which children's services. I will imagine, though, um, San Francisco has always been a progressive city in terms of the, the services it offers through the library. My best guess is that she really broadened the reach and the inclusiveness that we had because I know that when I go to work, I'm still working with the legacy that she left us, but specifics I just don't have. Okay. Again, we're really needing the, um, there needs, to, yes, Sylvia.
Do you have any idea what year she wrote that? Yeah. Mm. Sounds like a time capsule, a fabulous time capsule. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes. Uh, you spoke earlier about um, children not having books of their own. When I taught in the Upward Bound program working with teens, it turned out that some of them did not have any books of their own. They stopped their uh, textbooks in uh, secondary schools or went to them. And in some school, upward bound, we loaned books to them. So when I was able to take up a, a collection and buy a um, book of literature for them to give away at the end of summer school, I was stunned to find out a number of them just had their own books of books. I think you're right. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jean. Um, didn't you know Ms. Morris? Did you know her? I think you did. We're all needing to learn more, and we will. Yes, gentlemen in laptop. <laughs> Linda Geislinger? Yeah, she, she is actually a past um, employee of the San Francisco Public <laughs> Library, who I think was our coordinator of children's and services. Yeah. Together, right? mm -hmm. And so, but the, we have terrible records from, I'm looking back on my records from 2009 when I was doing this work. Um, but we, we, it is done, and it does need to, it's two tapes, and it's done on August 14th of a year we don't know. It's a question mark by the year, but we Usually you have, usually you have the other thing. Do you have it? Fabulous. Mm. So now we know more. It takes it takes a team. Mm -hmm. uh, but they exist for anybody that would like it, and maybe you want to get a copy of those. For, we certainly do. And Pat or I will share with whatever we know as we put together. Thank you. <laughs> so it might be something for the newsletter to use at some point. Too. Absolutely. What's that? And we did, uh, Sylvia and at all, we did actually feature that brochure on our flyer that we did for this event, too. Um, but most of us have never seen it in the, in the flesh, in the paper, in the ephemera. Yes? Oh, lost it? What did you do? Kate, can you get it back? Michael, Michael doesn't know how to use a cell phone. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't hear your question. Oh, yeah, Dave Egger Center, 826 Valencia, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. It's true, 826 Valencia. Um, actually, I think children and teens and tweens can be interns there. Beg your pardon? Well, I think the children can be interns at the publishing house. I mean, teens, tweens, and kids, which is pretty amazing. I know one who did it, and 
um, decided publishing wasn't going to be her destiny, but what a way, to, what a good way to learn. And were you wanting to add something, Michael? Well, it's just that, you know, I think it's tragic in a way that the people who have most to benefit from children reading, which is to say publishers, haven't done everything they could to help get books into their hands. They're, in effect, you know, creating readers out of children. What, what, could, what could be bad about that? You know, it's so funny. And I don't know what they can do. There's no kind of simple... Uh, I don't know what you mean. They do a lot. Well, what do you mean? Well, I, you know, um, do you believe that publishers in general are doing all they can to get books? Oh, and yeah. Scholastic and a lot of other publishers yeah. have all kinds of programs to do give they? out, okay. Okay. Um, extra, like, you know, overruns and free books to all kinds of, you know, underprivileged well, areas. Well, putting them together. I mean, you know, you were talking programs. You were saying about Lyme would be down the block. So wouldn't it be some way to meet the need of people who... I mean, it's kids who can buy books. Mm -hmm. They don't need them, but the kids who can't buy them. I mean, for, for kids to be without books who can't afford them. It's, there are still underserved are communities yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of programs. No, I, I just heard that there were programs in um, Greenwich. You know, in other words, where kids go and get, you know, and that was the Yeah. No, there are a lot of things. There are a lot of programs, and um, companies do a lot. Uh, not Actually, even like things like Burger King or whatever sometimes do special premium things so that they do um, certain... So some of our authors have done uh, projects where Burger King will take 100,000 of their books and do a little mini version to put inside the lunches, you know, for kids. Or I mean, a lot of corporations do things like that as well. That's wonderful to hear and more to be done all, all the time. Yes. I mean, there's always more you could do. Absolutely. I mean, I will speak as um, um, somebody who came from um, a holler in West Virginia. Family didn't have that much money and it was a first grade teacher and actually a school librarian that uh, noticed that I loved books. You know, when I was there at the school, I was just ravenously you know, rampaging through them. And so she, they called my mom and asked to like meet with her and said, she needs books. I mean, I probably wouldn't be here today, even in San Francisco, or definitely not in the Women's National Book Association. If it wasn't for a first grade teacher and a school librarian. Yay. Um, now I'm gonna ask a question that sounds really, um, lame, but I actually don't know what what inspired Effie Lee Morris to found the WNBA San Francisco chapter, and I know you three know. So, Andrea, do you want to start? I remember. <laughs> remember? New York requested it. Oh, okay. That could be. And they knew she was the fire starter? So, Women's National Book Association New York said, Effie Lee Morris, you're the one to make this happen. Well, we're so glad that she did. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Sure. So Effie Lee Morris was part of the New York Women's National Book Association from her brief time or brief years, I guess, working there at the New York yeah. Public Library. But also at the time, I mean, I think it was historically important in that, I mean, maybe California Writers Club, that was started by Jack London. So mm -hmm. they certainly had a branch. So they didn't have all the branches they have now. So like 17 or something. But this is one of the first group. And, it, you know, because of Effie Lee, there was more... There were more librarians in the group initially. Mm, right. Tried. Actually, it was all librarians at first, oh, I heard. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, she had said that. Um, she One thing that did distress her was that as the years went on, there were fewer and fewer members who were librarians. That's interesting. Yeah. It, it really evolved from uh, right. it, it broader-based initially and then became more and more. Yeah, by the time I was president, it was like more than half were writers. Yeah. <laughs> Direction it's gone. I think it's probably two-thirds right. writers right now. now. Yeah, sure. Just 100 101. Yeah. Kate, looks like you had something to add.
I mean, I have to say, she was a fierce woman. Even though she was quiet, she had a presence, she had a way mm -hmm. of expressing herself that was formidable. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew Effie, and we rubbed against each other as a child, uh, even though I was <coughs> Young enough. But when WNBA San Francisco chapter was about to dissolve, this would have been about seven years ago, mm -hmm. and they were ready to send the dissolution papers mm -hmm. to New York. Where even was San Francisco? The membership was just, yeah, there was, was non existent. Right. So what happened? What saved the chapter? Uh, yeah. So Elizabeth came to the meeting when Joan Delta mentioned. Yeah. President. And uh, Elizabeth Tejada said to Linda Lee, you could be the president. <laughs> and Linda Lee said, oh my god, I can't do that. And then Linda Joy Myers was on the other side of the room and said, you could be president. And so the two of them got together and they decided to be president. But they really didn't quite get what it was that they wanted to do. And it was turning to unravel so this one day, Linda Joy Myers phoned me up in Santa Rosa. She said, hey, would you, uh, would you be the vice president? <laughs> and I thought about it, and I heard Effie Lee Clark. And she was passed away by then. But I thought, Effie, I'm doing this for you. <laughs> 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 roared into the unraveling of the organization, and I thought Effie would not want this organization to die because it's more than a writers' club. And mm -hmm. what I always felt about WNBA and Effie is that Effie Lee <clears throat> is that it wasn't so much a service for writers as it was writers providing a service to the community. As a network that supported one another as women, but also the community that we live in. Yeah. With books, with literacy, with you know, with uh, with picturama. Mm -hmm. With doing events that reach beyond our own women of diversity events. And These are two fundamental challenges that I think nonprofits uh, face. I mean, we've been involved with the organization for like you know 50 years now, since it started, just about. Um, and um, they have ups and downs depending on the leadership, depending on finding leadership, because one of the challenges is bringing people along, finding people who uh, uh, um, uh, you know, are willing to participate and, and, and join and work their way up through the ranks. And I I think this. That may be, to some degree, a people may be victims of technology. You know, I mean, one of the, my favorite paradox of technology is that the, the more time-saving devices we have, the less time we have. Yeah. Yeah. I so that. someday we won't have to do anything, but we won't have the time to do it. Do you so, also remember yeah, when we? Do you remember when we were also in trouble when we almost uh, were disbanded? We thought we would have this big lawsuit when the when WNBA, which was our our. Um, an acronym, then they was the Women's National Basketball Association. Oh. <laughs> and they came along, and we were furious because we said, they can't use WNBA. We already have WNBA. And we wrote to them, their lawyers. We got a lawyer. I remember we paid a lawyer. He wrote this letter. And they wrote back saying, heck with you. Sorry, we're using it. We're bigger than you. We have more high-paid lawyers than you. And if you want to sue us, fine, but we can disband you. We can make you go away. And we really thought for a while that we were going to disappear, the whole organization, not just this chapter. Mm -hmm. But for a while, they were really worried in New York and other places that we would be forced to stop being able to use Women's National Book Association. Well, I mean, you know, they now retweet us and, and uh, like what we're doing, like different teams or whatever. It's kind of amazing. <laughs> 
I do the social media for us partially because I just like to, to know, you know, I like to dish out information even if I'm not a librarian. And so I love to find things like the fact that like there's a women only bookstore opening up that like Penguin is doing a women only books pop up. Um, like actually started this March and that like there's a new publisher I think in Portland that's publishing books by women writers only. So I like to scour the interwebs and find pro-women, pro-diversity, you know, things that I think match, you know, our mission of WNBA. And Joyce Carol Oates retweeted us this week. I mean, it's pretty amazing. But I think that uh, it's interesting because I think in certain ways, like, I can see where there would have been that tension, but now they're fans of ours. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> yes. I, I mentioned that one cha uh, challenge for nonprofits in general is that they ebb and flow with the energy and creativity. Uh, we've had some wonderful presidents over the years. Um, so finding new people is one challenge. The other thing is keeping the organization relevant, like this picturama. It's really responding to what people need. So kind of, kind of reinventing yourself as needed to meet the needs of writers or the literary community. Right. And, um, you know, we get contacted by people who want to know more about Picturama. And of course, like, I will jump on the phone anytime to explain. And one uh, woman that I talked to yesterday, actually, is a Filipina who lives in way up northern California. And uh, she said, this is very little known. Um, so um, I think I'm breaking news here to a certain extent. But General MacArthur, you know, who is uh, regarded as like the savior of the Philippines, actually had a real issue that he liked underage Filipina girls. And I'm, I don't mean to be disgusting. It's just that this is the truth that she knows from growing up there. And uh, so she uh, was telling me about her book and asking if she thought anyone would be interested. And I said, Sounds like it's MacArthur's Me Too moment. And yeah, I actually think there will be people that'll be interested. And so, um, you know, she said it's this secret history that is not known outside of the Philippines. And she thinks people need to know that he wasn't the great hero, the savior, that actually, like, there was this whole, you know, um, hidden horror story. I didn't mean to bum everyone out. I'm just telling you some truth. <laughs> Yes, I, I was actually, I mean, you know, I was in my mind, like, going through exactly who she needed to pitch it to, to and gave her some specific editors and agents and publishers. So I guess that would be, you know, that's me as a publishing person and editor helping a fellow writer. But definitely that's what I feel like our chapter does. And I'm glad, I'm glad to know our history. <laughs> um, thanks for coming in and saving it. I sort of feel like that karmically, maybe it needed to be a librarian who has mastery of information <laughs> that could like go in and just sort of like take this messy thing and organize it and fix it, right? You know, every time I thought I was never going to learn an Excel spreadsheet <laughs> or really uh, know how to do our website, even though we really kept the sheet, these were the nuts and bolts of an organization. And I would say, Ellen, Julie, I'm doing this for you. <laughs> and you know what was at the heart of it was really the idea of joy. And I think it's not an accident that Women's mm -hmm. National Book Association has a book right in the middle of its title. Mm -hmm. They felt that books could change the world. And in many ways, they were right. So I think, you know, going back to the chapter and equity, I have a feeling she's happy that we're discussing it like this because she wants us to get at the heart of mm -hmm. And, you know, even though we don't know the details of her childhood, how she came to be <clears throat> pioneer, what drove her, Absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Jean?
was at the library for that sacred space. Mm -hmm. The first time I saw a library book built by Mother Field, and I said, Oh, that boy, this I'm going to get. <laughs> Here, here. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. If, if libraries are churches, does that mean Lynn Davidson is a priestess? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. A I goddess. Of the Children's goddess. Center. Mm -hmm. Priestess slash goddess. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I'm another chunk of truth that I'll uh, spew out from the lectern is that I'm sure you guys are aware that Barnes & Noble is in upheaval, but Barnes & Noble that ran out so many wonderful independent bookstores and, and now are hoist upon their own petard. But in any case, while they've been cutting way back on their buys of books, libraries are rising up and taking their place. It's really fascinating. Uh, Baker and Taylor and all those jobbers and uh, libraries and school libraries are are buying more books than than ever. They, have, I mean, from what I can tell, like in the last three years, it's uh, almost doubled. And so I don't know what that means, and would love any information that that you might have. But I think it's a wonderful sign, and publishers love them because they're non-returnable book sales. <laughs> But also, independents uh, are doing have been, mm -hmm. their sales have been doing increasing better. over the last mm -hmm. several years, and new stores are opening. Another good sign is part of this buy local kind of thing. That's, mm -hmm. that's that's all good. And Northern California is the best collection of independent booksellers in the country. Absolutely. So great thing. Yes. Plus, it's such a beautiful facility. I know that um, the San Francisco Writers Conference is doing groovy events there seemingly all the time. And we're doing a member writers um, event. Um, I think I was luring Louise Nair into that. Uh, August, uh, August 8th. I'm not 100% sure of that, but my recollection is that it's an author's launch on August 8th. Okay. They also have a monthly third Friday of the month, they have a free monthly writer's lunch. Uh, not, you bring, it's brown bag, actually. You bring a sandwich. But there's m m uh, monthly meetings for writers free at, at the library. And speaking of members, authors, books, when you were uh, given a ticket by the handsome gentleman back there, that was your raffle ticket, so you might not want to run out the door because that's a signed member author book, <laughs> but I see that a, a generous situation just happened. So let, let me know when you feel like you're um, filled up with answers to your questions about the legacy of Ms. Effie Lee Morris, and then we can give you some signed new books by member authors, WNBA member authors. One, yes, please. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, she won the same award, that Women's National Book Award that we gave out. Mm -hmm. That's right. Fellow West That's Virginian. Right. <laughs> yes. No offense to any of the men here, but I think women <laughs> will save the world. <laughs> Well, there's no question. I, I think the, all the world, what's wrong with the world could be summarized by the imbalance between yin and yang. Mm -hmm. You know, one time I had a, we went to the Romance Writers of America. They had, the chapter met in Berkeley. And it was like 100 women in the room. And it was wonderful. It was very nurturing. And, and it was just wonderful. And, and I just I finally realized it was, the reason it was so wonderful is there was no men. <laughs> it was absolutely remarkable. Nope. All that oxytocin, the nurturing, literally, like protect and defend, as opposed to like eh, compete and tear down. The Women's National Book Association, even though men are allowed to be members. Oh, absolutely. We accept men. <laughs> um, Lynn, this is a question for you, and maybe a question for both you and Andrea. But um, when I saw the um, special collection, and recognize that some of the books were, in my opinion, rare. I, you know, I thought, I wonder if any publishers like should be thinking of bringing these back. Like, for example, Heyday Books, which I know is sort of a non-profit, I think not for profit, uh, and they like uh, folklore and especially like California folklore um, and history. So I wonder if anyone has tried to connect those dots or if that's even an appropriate thought to have. It's a fine. If they're out of copyright, that's fine. Well, actually, I was wondering whether Andrea should get Jennifer Mark Soloway, you know, here to check out the collection. She was going to come tonight, but she's no, no, but sick. See in general, yeah. to see the collection, to see if there's anything yeah. that could be resold. Perhaps uh, the problem it. is that publishers are so caught up with the newest things and <laughs> the new front list and finding the next big thing that, you know, isn't out there yet. Um, they just, you know what? Most publishers have no respect for, I think, a lot of the older titles and out-of-print books that should definitely be back in print. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, right? Well, when you talk to the publishers. It's it's like New York Review of Books, which puts old classics back in print. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. we did that with our uh, Daniel Pinkwater books. They did that. Well, so, but yeah. maybe there's an but, opportunity there that hasn't Yeah, been. it's the, very small. They'll take yeah. somebody like Pinkwater, who's got the name and he's on it. Heyday Books seems to me that they stand for something beyond like the, you know, the mo well, of the moment. It's not clear to me they're doing children's books, though. They still are. Well, they are still. Okay, well, yes. they are, sure. Yeah, speaking yeah. just about children's books, I mean, I completely agree that the, the front list is uppermost in the publisher's mind. Yeah. Um, well, what I notice, too, is that a lot of children's books will go out of print after just a couple of years. Mm -hmm. so Especially we, Random House. Yes. They annoy me to no end. Mm -hmm. They'll put a book out of print, in, in six months, nine months, he'll give a book. No other publishers do that with children's books because, as Lynn knows, it takes a while for children's books to get some traction well, and build, and most publishers will give a book a few years. Right. Not and Random so, House. So, so are they available as e-books then, even? Not, not if they could put them out of print. Well, sometimes there are, sometimes, but they don't sell enough e-books and kids' books. That's right. Children, yeah. children don't read e-books. I mean, they, they do. Right. <laughs> So what, just anecdotally from our experience. Yeah. No, they like books. They like, because they're on the screen all day. Mm -hmm. So when they want to read for fun, they like holding a book. So I'll tell you what happens when we get kids coming in the library and we say, well, our, our I call it the book book. So the book book is not on the shelf right now. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to put the e-book in your hands and get you connected with the e-book? And my estimation is nine out of ten kids will just say no. I want to hold the book in my hand. They, they just don't relate to a book that way. And I think ebooks definitely have their place. Everything that, that we create as a publishing universe has its place and has its audience. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing about real physical books for children is that it's an entire sensory experience. It's not just abstract. Mm -hmm. Books are, are things that you can smell and touch and for some of our littlest kids taste. Mm. And, and <laughs> well, especially picture books, seeing the art. You know, you right are. in front yeah. of you, yeah. And, and holding the, the item in your hand is just a completely different sensory experience that I think we take away from kids to their detriment. Well, but, uh, you know, the, you remember more 
when you see something in print than you do just seeing it on a screen. So there's the memory factor. Um, and uh, also, you know, ebooks are primarily a fictional medium, particularly genre fiction. Mm -hmm. So there's that. So, yeah. Yes. I'm a writer, and I have uh, three books published and uh, two books that I have not yet published. Mm -hmm. And yes, you write and adult thrillers. Know. What do you mean, Effie um, Lee's collection? Yes. Yes, someone has actually done that. Good. Yeah. So that it exists going up to paper. Yeah, so the Internet Archive um, has been doing that for a number of um, rare and unusual children's books over the years. And I actually did a project with the Effie Lee Morris Historical Collection to see which of the books might need to be digitized. And fortunately for us, the Internet Archive other libraries and institutions that hold a lot of our titles have already digitized them for us. And so the one that we did identify was published right here in San Francisco on Van Ness Street. It's called Polly's Lion. I do not recommend it for literary value, um, <laughs> but it's, it is of historic value because it was published in San Francisco and deals with local themes. And so we actually digitized that ourselves here and submitted it to the Internet Archive. Mm. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you. Um, some of them are out of copyright. I'm sure there's several candidates that are eligible for that. Any other questions? I have one last question before we go to the raffle, raffle segment of the evening. Any other questions? Well, here's my question to anyone that wants to answer it. Um, what do we think Effie Lee Morris would ask us to do in our 50th year as the WNBA or our 50th year as San Francisco citizens? And, and um, what do you think she would say, do this, focus on this? Yes, Dr. Jean. <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly with her and you. Make sure that every child in San Francisco wants to read a book has access to it. Yes. Agreed. Kate, any thoughts? They may. We actually make our um, library overstocks and, and withdrawn library books available to nonprofit groups in the community who want to schedule a time to come mm -hmm. and look at the collection and, and take what they need. They have to come to you. H how many groups, such groups, do you work with? Um, no, I don't do the direct yeah, working with the groups, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I know that teachers and schools and nonprofit organizations oh, can make oh, appointments oh, yeah. and come in and whatever they need, they can take. Yeah. That's a great idea. Thank you. I know in San Francisco schools, we have so many books and there's so much need. We're able to purchase a great deal in our schools. Almost too much. Wow. Partly because the city is rich. 
Good. And so the, what they charge for rents here, that's what, <laughs> housing. Well, that's a wonderful um, idea. That's great, yeah. Well, speaking of getting books out into the community, who has ticket number 542736?